So, um, um, I'm Francesca Vitalini, and I'm a senior solution consultant at Mirai Solutions. And today I'm here to moderate the panel, our user or our developer. Uh, this is the question, and it's actually really a question because uh, since I started talking about this uh, with my colleagues and uh, in my network, I realized there is really no consensus of what these two roles are in the community, uh, what type of skills uh, should an R developer have versus an R user, or um, what type of backgrounds uh, is it involved. So uh, I realized it's really important for us to have uh, a, an open conversation about this. And today we are going to do it with uh, um, five different uh, experts uh, of our community that I'm really happy to host here today. So uh, we have here, I'm going to read a tiny bit of a biography, sorry. So we have Martin, who is a professor of statistics at the mathematics department of ADH. And it's, uh, um, he, he was one of the pioneers of the R language and is currently a part of the R development team and the R foundation for the R project. Then we have Alexis Siglauer, who is head of uh, analytics and technology um, department at Partnery. And he has expertise in the reinsurance business, but also bridging the gap between commercial, actuarial, and analytic teams. We have Nick Crane, who is a data scientist and a software developer with expertise in uh, production grade code and training. And she has experience in developing both R packages and Shiny applications, as well as NLP models in Python. Then we have Sandrine Dudois. I hope I'm pronouncing the surname correctly. My French is terrible. Anyhow, uh, she's a professor and the chair of the Department of Statistics and professor of the Division of Biostatistics at the University of California, Berkeley, with a research focus in uh, development of statistical methods and software for uh, bio biomedical and genomic data. She's also a funding core developer of the Bioconductor project, together with the, our last but not least uh, panelist Raffaele Irizzari, who is uh, also a professor of applied statistics at Harvard and chair of the Department of Data Science at Data Farber Cancer Institute, and is also a developer of open source software and uh, for the implementation of statistical methodology and part of the bio Bioconductor project since the very beginning. So, um, I'm very happy to have you all here, as well as uh, our audience. And um, I would also like to thank uh, our sponsors. I was mm, loosely coupled with the organizing uh, committee of User 2021, especially in the um, sponsoring section. So I really know how important it is to, uh, to have people supporting us. So I'm going to say thank you for the sponsor of the day, which is our studio. Now, uh, with no future ado, because we only have one hour, I would like to dig in and start with the first real question, which is, uh, um, what is the definition of an R developer and how does it distinguish itself from, uh, um, from being an R user? And I would like to ask all our panelists to uh, give a little bit of their own perspective, also based on their different background. So, uh, why don't you start, Martin? Hello, everybody. I'm, I have the perspective of, yes, of an R core member, but also of an academic who teaches uh, math and stats and computational stats and things like that. Um, and as many of you know, R is really, in some sense, the, the, daughter, the daughter or son of S. And uh, John Chambers is, is the guy who mostly devised uh, the S system. And he got the very famous computer science award, the ACM award, uh, which is only given to one person once a year uh, for, for uh, creating S. And he wrote the book. That's now the topic. He wrote the book with the title Programming with Data Using R or Using S. And so his approach is good data analysis, good statistics, good data science, whatever you want to do it, good machine learning means programming. You cannot do good data analysis if you just click buttons and choose from an user. So, so you have to do programming and creating S and from there R really provided tools to use high level programming languages that doesn't need a computer science education, that doesn't need compilers and so on, as you all know, 
uh, to do data analysis that is adapted to your uh, to your data situation to the problem you want to solve. And so, in this sense, uh, I think all good data analysts, data scientists, should be programmers using R. And in that sense, in that sense, in that wide sense, all such good data analysts are or developers, because some people told me, well, a developer is somebody who programs, uh, who writes code. And in this sense, good data analysts writes our code, even writes our functions to make his whole analysis somewhat reproducible, well-documented and so on. Yeah. Nick, do you agree with uh, Martin's perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I definitely agree with the idea that, you know, um, it, it's quite a wide thing that we could probably call a lot of people in our developer. Um, I think this question also is something that we really need to be careful about the context that we're asking it in, um, because we're at a real risk of potentially sounding quite gatekeepery. So at a kind of high level, absolutely, you know, and our developer is somebody that writes our code. Um, I might even put something in there about a little bit of knowledge of software engineering principles, even something as simple as writing functions or even including documentation. Um, but then it gets more complicated, I guess, if we're thinking about that distinction in the context of the job market, right? Because I think a lot of the time, an R developer um, and a data scientist can be very similar, but there's more distinction between data scientists and Python developers, say, than data scientists and R developer. And I think it gets a bit more complicated when you get to that point. Yes, thank you very much. And um, Alexis, what is your perspective from an industry point of view? So I, there's a difference between people who use R and use that to fit models who are clearly writing code and what I would call an R developer. For me, an R developer, and a distinct from R core developer, which is something else, but an R developer is someone who applies software engineering principles to build production code and environments and happens to use R to do so. And that makes it rare because R is not a particularly well-known computer science type language in comparison to say Python, but in the right context and in the right organization, and we've recently hired our own R developer, uh, where we say there are reasons why we want to build production software in R. And it's not about fitting models and it's not about data science actually, and it's not about ML or anything like that. It's about build our code, which is production ready, which can be deployed, which is reproducible, which is scalable. Um, use techniques from software engineering to make sure it will be maintainable and robust also for your colleagues to work with. And when you do that, you are, in our context, an R developer. Thank you, Alexis. And uh, Sandrine, what about uh, academia? This, is it the same there? Uh, hi, everyone, and, and thanks, Francesca, for putting together the panel. So, so yeah, so what's an R developer? That's, that's not such an easy question, and I think that's one that we could ask for um, other languages as well, and it's clear already from talking to, to different panelists that there are different perspectives uh, in academia or in industry or even within academia and industry. Um, I think I'll step back a little bit. Um, so there's really a range of expertise in our users uh, from someone that uh, just uses the software for the first time to someone that advances the language and, and makes research level contributions uh, to computing. So, so I think a software developer, an R developer is somewhere on that spectrum. The real difficulty is um, where you put the boundary and also what features of that person you use to define that boundary. So, so, you know, for instance, you could put a developer as someone that contributes a package to a repository like CRAN or Bioconductor or someone that produces production level software. Um, but then I think there's a real big difference between someone like me um, who contributes packages and then say an R core developer like Martin who advances the field of statistical computing. So I, I often use this analogy from math um, so there's a big difference between someone that uh, uses a theorem, applies a theorem in a very useful manner, and then someone that actually proves that theorem. So, so I do think it's worth adding maybe a third category to reflect at least three levels, you know, that, that cover the whole spectrum. So beginner, intermediate, and advanced. 
Um, so, so I think the real question is define the variables of the features of, uh, that would define these different types of our users or developers and try to come up with an understanding. So I really look forward to hearing more about this. Thank you. And last but not least, Rafael, uh, what do you think? Do you agree with this uh, uh, three category model or uh, you have a different opinion? Yeah, I, I mostly agree with what Sandrine, uh, the, the Sandrine explained also my definition is similar to Alexis. So I, I, the first thing I thought about when you invited me to participate in this panel is why are we defining this? What's the point of defining this term? And the the one reason I can come up with, and it's it's something that I actually is somewhat important to me, is for hiring people. So if I'm going to use that term to hire people, I want it to mean something that everybody views as, has the same definition. That will make my life easier. That's a selfish goal, but let's take that goal as my goal for for now. So in that, with that goal in mind, I would, defi I would define uh, our developers similar to Alexis uh, and Sandrine. I, I, I have two jobs. I am an academic that writes uh, papers and tries to disseminate st statistical methodology or, or computational algorithms that I come up with or my, my students and postdocs. And I'm also the chair of a data science department at a cancer center where we actually develop production code for making decisions uh, for patient care. Those are different, very different, but at, at the end, the, the, the R part is similar. So in the case of an academic, I, if I come up with an idea that I, I, I arrive at, as Martin described, programming with data in R, uh, and I, have, I want to share this idea with the world, want others to use it, to implement it. I want it to be fast, efficient, well-documented. So I want, I have become too busy to do that myself. So I want to, I want to like, I want to hire someone to do it for me now or for, for my postdocs and students, wherever else. Um, and there's also the other reason too, is because there's people out there that do it much, much better than me. So I would, I would define our developer as someone who could write efficient R code, know how to, how to pack, make packages, know how to document, know how to, uh, make, make it efficient. And by, for example, writing C++ code or, or using matrix algebra. And, then that, and that's similar to, to, the, other, to the other side of, of my job, which is to, to implement production software. So in that sense, that's how I would define uh, our developer. I also, when I first heard the, to the, the topic of, the, of, the, um, of, of this panel, the when I thought of our developer, this is before I had thought about it more after our conversations. The first thing that came to mind was someone that, that was making our um, improving the R language. But since we've since we have conversations, I've had I now have a more practical definition of, of what an R developer is. Yeah, that's great. I'm uh, really happy that this uh, uh, panel is already bringing something useful, <laughs> even if it started uh, in less than 10 minutes ago. Anyhow, um, let me uh, share my screen again. I would like to show you what has uh, the community said so far. Uh, so quite interesting, uh, interestingly, uh, almost 50% of uh, the people who took this survey, and we are talking about a really uh, small amount of people, it was uh, about 150 people who took the survey over the span of a week. Um, well, they thought that uh, um, an R developer is someone who developed tools for others to use, and this can be also domain specific. Then 21% uh, of believes that uh, it's someone who structures the code as a package. 13% uh, uh, believes it's someone who extends the R language. 10% uh, uh, is uh, someone who applies basic software development concepts uh, to code designs, and the rest is uh, other answers. And also in terms of uh, defining an R developer versus an R user, we see uh, quite a bit of a variety. We had uh, this question both in the survey and in the LinkedIn poll that I ran for a couple of weeks. And then we saw uh, in both cases quite a uniform distribution, slightly picked towards the R user. Um, but yeah, this is another sign for me that there isn't a clear definition or, or a clear understanding of what an R user is uh, with respect to um, an R developer. 
Okay, so uh, with this, I would like to go back to what Rafael uh, said at the end of his uh, uh, answer, and it's about hiring. So, first of all, Nick, what do you think uh, is uh, um, the concept uh, of an art developer in the job market? Yeah, so I guess as I was saying before, it's really kind of can be hard to distinguish. So, for example, I've had previous jobs where I've had the job title data scientist or data science consultant. But actually, when you look at the work I've been doing, it has been mainly our development. Um, so with that, it, it becomes difficult. And then there's so many different facets within R. Like, again, I've been an R developer. I've ended up doing web app development. I've ended up doing package development. I've ended up doing machine learning. So, again, it's really hard to pin it down. Although with all of those things said, as somebody that doesn't come from a traditional computer science background, I think the things that have made me stand out from other candidates that I've been told have been useful when I've been applying for our related jobs that have been more developer focused and say stats focused have been things like knowledge of concepts like unit testing, version control, deployment, coding standards, and all those more kind of traditional software engineering type concepts. And I think that probably comes from the fact that traditionally, if we kind of divide data science into R and Python, a lot of our users will come from an academic background, which isn't necessarily computer science. And I think it's those bits and pieces that can make somebody stand out a bit more. And I see you, Alexis, nodding uh, there. So what do you look for when you hire an R developer, considering that you just hired one? So I think what Nick just described is what I would call the carpentry of R development. So of any development, actually, unit testing, deployment, automation, mastery of your tools, and so on. And then for an advanced R developer, I would be looking for someone who can I don't know, think in a computer science way. So here is an algorithm in code. Is this heavy on memory or on computation? What if your memory is constrained? How would you modify this? Uh, how do you do the trade-offs which you would do in software engineering? How do you trade off speed versus memory? How do you understand that, um, or can you, if we go, okay, this is cool, but now we need to parallelize it. How would you do it effectively? And then linking that to, R has some really sneaky gotchas when you're trying to vectorize or turn something into matrices or so on. Do you understand these concepts and do you understand how they apply to R and do you understand how these trade-offs work so that you can develop something truly next level when asked to do so? And that's those are software development skills linked to knowledge of the R language. It's um, And for me, it's generally genuinely both. It is R developer. I expect all these things of a developer, but if somebody has all these things and just knows it for Python or for C++ and doesn't know it for R, they will not be able to perform in this role because they don't necessarily know and understand how the underpinnings of R can help or hinder you as you're trying to solve these questions. And Rafael, do you agree with Alexis? Do you think this is applicable in academia as well? Absolutely, 100%. Both, both Nick and, and Alexis, they were, they, I, they're hitting, they're, they're basically uh, uh, summarizing what I, what I think we need to explain when, when we write a job ad. Um, and that's what I was referring to when, when I said I would, I would hire them not only because I don't have that much time anymore, but because they're much better than me at, at things like unit testing so, and other software engineering principles. So that's, that's exactly right. I think it's, it's, that's how I, would want to write an ad now to hire a, a software engineer explaining all those all those things it has to be r uh because and why does it have to be r that's something else we haven't talked about like if, if, if you're if all you want to do is share your statistical ideas it could be done in python or whatever else but but i think it's there's a lot it's, there's two reasons one is because already the the prototype will be done in r and second because the users that we're targeting are are mostly r users uh, at least I, at least in my case, this maybe Python is close, but um, in, in the genomics world, it's, it's about even right now. But yeah, I agree. Okay, so uh, maybe you can continue in this and tell us a little bit what type of skills uh, practically should the, this uh, uh, person have? Like, should they know uh, DevOps, uh, uh, version control, or uh, which ones would be the most important for you? And maybe Alexis, you can follow up there with what would be most important in your case. Oh, sorry, did you ask that one to me, Francesca, first? 
Oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, I didn't. But if oh. you want, if you have an opinion on that, please no, no, I, that. I, I thought you said Nick, but you didn't, so I don't need. Yeah. No, I was asking Rafael to continue oh, on that, of course, uh, yeah. but uh, um, yeah, feel free to. Well, go to Adam. I don't want. I don't want to be repetitive. A lot of a lot of the concepts and skills have already been um, described. The one that I the one that I would add for my own area is it, it's we we don't always get this, and you can learn it on the job. But if you get someone that already knows the details and the nuances of the biological problem or technological uh, or, or the technology that's generating the data, that is, that is a huge plus. It saves us a lot of time um, in, in training them. And of course, I imagine that's similar to other application areas. But other than that, I think between Nick and Alexis, they, they kind of mentioned everything I would, I would, I would um, put on the list. Yeah. I would add one, I'll call it a non-technical skill. It's a behavioral skill, empathy with the end user. So that it's, 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 if you're technically amazing, but either the end users don't want to talk to you or you don't understand what they're actually after and you don't build what is actually needed, then you are not as valuable as you could be to the success of the, of the organization you're in. And Martin, maybe what would be, in your opinion, the, the top skill that an art developer should have? Unmute yourself, please. <laughs> I'm used to teaching there. I'm never muted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, Rafi made a very important remark. There are some skills that you can learn on the job and you should learn because it's inside the company you work. They have their standards anyway. Um, and so, so I think it, it, it's, it's, uh, well, of course, I'm, I have the point of view. I want to be, to teach people to be creative and thorough and um, self-critical data analysts. And that's something that needs much more time than to learn a new style or to learn a new dialect of C or whatever. Uh, so the question is really, and, and I, I see that there's in the Q&A, somebody actually asked the question too. Now, uh, most our users, and that's probably still true, uh, come from statistical data science background and not from computer science. At least that's very much the case in Europe. I don't know how much it's in the on the West Coast or in California now that things change. Uh, and of course, in industry, there are computer scientists too that, that come to use R. But I, I still think the the data analysis skill, which is not a, just a pipeline of things you run your data through and then you get the output, is something that needs time to be taught. Uh, and, and, and we still emphasize to teach that to our students and not computer science skills, because then they, well, if they go to computer science, that's fine. And, and, and machine learning is actually at, at our institute, machine learning is is uh, taught by both statistics and, and computer science with an emphasis on computer science, whereas then there are other fields. So, so can, I, can I comment on something? I, mm -hmm. I agree with everything that Martin is saying, but I would agree to it when describing a data analyst, which I consider to be a separate task uh, than a software developer. And I, in academia, at least the, the academia I've experienced, we have good academics that are good at data analysis and we teach it. And it's hard to teach, like Martin says, it takes time, you have to be, there's a lot of critical thinking, but we're not, at least in my experience, we're not that great at, at software engineering. There are some, there are good ones out there. There's, you know, our core and the people developing tidyverse and data table, they're great software engineers, but that, I don't think that the majority in, in academia, we tend to not, it's trained and also we don't have the incentives are in place to make you spend more time developing do, performing data analysis and developing methods either of the two depending how applied you are so that, so there's not that many rewards for, for, in my opinion unfortunately for people who spend a lot of time making their software very efficient very user friendly and that's why we're trying now now we're trying to because there's no incentives from the academia side, we're trying to 
use grant funding or other funding to hire people that are really, really good at that and let them do that part. Given that it's hard to, it's hard for me to tell a postdoc or a graduate student, spend the next six months making the software really, really good as opposed to telling them write another paper. It's not, my, it's not really my decision, right? It's, it, that's just the incentive, incentive structure that's in place right now. We, and we're all trying to, to make it, to reward more for people who actually take the time to it, but it hasn't quite happened yet. Uh, that's this, what this uh, yeah. point of because it really brings me to say something. So the, forwarding my list of questions, there was one about the way we teach R, and I would like to ask Sandrine if uh, should we shouldn't uh, start to include some uh, computer science uh, uh, elements in the way we teach R already, considering that normally the R user or the R practitioner is someone that is uh, maybe coming from a, a very domain specific background and not computer uh, science. Right, definitely, and and I just want to say that I you know I echo what Martin and Rafa have just said. Um, about the qualities that we're looking in, it's in the self-criticism is key, common sense is key. And then Rafael mentioned this um, idea of incentive system. I mean, there's been a lot of resistance in academia about spending time, not just on, on statistical computing, but even applied statistics. So I think we really need to, to change that and, and, and start including these in the curriculum. So, so you can go, you can learn by doing, um, that's one way, but at some point, I think you do also need some form of training uh, to be able to have, you know, general concepts about computing and, and more concepts from computer science to incorporate that in the statistics or data science curriculum. Um, you know, before doing that, I think we have to think about what populations of students we want to train. It's not one size fits all. And then for each of these different populations, think about the learning objectives. So, so just from my own, <laughs> perspective, um, you know, chairing a statistics department, we already have different populations of students. We have our non-majors who, you know, we basically want to teach them a little bit of data literacy and computer literacy, but they will most likely not end up being developers. So, so that's a population we have to think what we want to impart to them. Then there's um, our graduate students. Um, so for these students, we want to teach them more advanced notions about data analysis and, and, and in computing. And there's a real problem here in particular with data analysis is it doesn't scale up very well. <laughs> um, you know, if you really want to teach applied statistics or the practice of statistics or, or computing with data, you want to start with case studies and, and it's a bit of an art and here interaction is really important. It's not something you can just do passively teaching to a huge audience and, and you know, it takes time and, and interactions. So, I think identifying the different groups of students and learning objective would be a start and just making, it's a lot of communication around that and, and showing the value of teaching statistical computing to the academic community. It's not computer science, it's not statistics, it's sort of something that brings elements of both and that will be evolving as data science is evolving nowadays. I, I think it's very hard to teach computer, to teach, good software engineering practice in the context of a data science program or a statistical program because your constraint is time. <clears throat> and then like both you and Raphael have said, incentive. Software engineering is a craft. It's something, I mean, you speak to software engineers and they'll tell you, and I know this from my own experience, the first language you learn is a language. The second language teaches you concepts. But by the time you've learned your fifth programming language, you're starting to understand software engineering and have seen the sort of deeper patterns and teaching multiple software languages in parallel to an entire data science curriculum is both challenging time-wise people only have so many hours in their semester and incentive-wise if i'm a data scientist why would i learn these things when i think i'd probably better learn bayesian methods of machine learning because that makes me more marketable in the job market so I think producing our developers straight out of university is really hard. Our developer is the marriage of people using R, having experience, somehow melding those two things together, a lot like Nick has described her journey. And then at some point you go, oh yeah, I've got both sets of skills. I can program in R and I know what it is. Uh, and that's, that's how our developers are made. I think it's very hard to teach them. 
So with this idea that the app developer can be a bit of a unicorn, uh, but it's a, a necessary one to uh, have production ready code, then can we say that R is a language ready for production? And I would like to ask Nick to comment on this because you have the experience of bringing or of producing production ready code. Yeah, absolutely. So actually, when people express scepticism about this idea, it really frustrates me. I, I was in a job interview in about 2018 with a multinational consulting company, which I won't name, and they dismissed R as, oh, it's just something people use in academia and people don't use that in prod, which is utter nonsense. All it meant is they didn't know how to put it in production themselves, which is very different. Um, you know, um, our, there's, there's so many tools out there. You've got things like you can make APIs with Plumber, web apps with Shiny, um, so many different things out there. So in terms of, you know, our in production, there's so many examples as well. So I've worked on projects that have involved kind of making a massive Shiny app that can support hundreds of concurrent users that's now used in the um, NHS in the UK. Um, I've worked on projects that involve writing packages and APIs that are used by the Office for National Statistics. So I find it completely ridiculous when people say R is not ready for production. And um, I think as Mark Sellers said in, I think it was our studio conference 2019, it's cultural, not technical bar barriers that get in the way of R going into production. <laughs> Run over. <laughs> Com completely agree. Hello, I just realized we have questions in both the Q&A and the chat. So, you know. In case you're looking. Oh, Francesco, you muted them. E, I did I? I didn't want to mute people. I was trying to unmute myself. Anyway, um, what I wanted to say is that it's great that we have questions in the Q and A. Um, I will uh, reserve a little bit of time at the end of my moderation to. Uh, take whatever the audience is interested in and ask it to all the panels, the panelists. Uh, but please, can you put the questions, not in the chat, but in the Q&A, and you can also vote for questions in there so that we will take the most popular first. Thank you. Um, so uh, back to the main point here, we were talking about R being a language for production. And uh, um, I, I wanted to ask if, uh, being R a language that is uh, um, very user-friendly uh, makes it more a language uh, uh, ready for production or more a language ready for POCs. And uh, Alexis, what do you think about that? In production is a definition, right? In production means, yeah, it's up and it's running and it, it can do certain stuff. And we well-written code is easy to maintain in production. Um, it's not just about getting it out there and it actually working. Uh, the easier your language is to use, generally, the easier it is to maintain, the easier it is to collaborate on a project, the easier it is to modularize pieces, the easier it is to possibly deploy into a more microservice architecture. R, doesn't have a comp sci background. It's if you compare it to languages of, which have been built to be in production, you look at Rust, you look at Go, um, it's not there, but that doesn't mean it can't be used in production. C, sort of how much of the universe runs on C? C is a horrible language to put into production um, because it has no guardrails. Um, there are so many security holes in the world's infrastructure because this was written in C by well-intentioned people and it didn't get the daylights tested out of it. Uh, so I, I don't think the user-friendliness of the language is a way to think about whether something can be put into production. It's about, is the core bug free? If something goes wrong, can you find something? Do you have the tools available to modularize and to collaborate and to deploy automatically? And all of that is the case for R. Is it the right choice for every organization? No, but in an organization which has a lot of people in it who already use R as part of their daily work, it's, it's a good choice because that means if somebody's looking at an internal website and something's not working, they can go look at the source code and understand it as opposed to this has been written in Lisp and good luck because uh, nobody else in the organization or the front end of the organization understands that language. 
nonetheless uh, R being uh, an approachable language uh, has clearly been one of its uh, success factors uh, so that now is one of the most used programming languages so uh, I would like to ask Martin what do you think uh, is uh, uh, the uh, the reason or one of the things that makes it really approachable Well, I, I know about four or five computer languages, but not many more. Um, so I, I think we we started teaching our to our students very early, or even and even students that are far away from uh, computer science, even much further away than mathematicians are, for instance. And we never used the, the thing that is called I forget. <laughs> John Fox menu system. Anyway, we thought uh, that it, it is easy enough. Uh, we started to say, okay, it's just like a pocket calculator, but that of course nowadays it doesn't work anymore because people have their smartphones. They don't even know what the pocket calculator is. But uh, yeah, still, I mean, you can start just by adding numbers and uh, it has a state and it is interactive. Uh, you don't need compilers. You don't, there, there are many things that you don't even have to learn about. Um, and at the very beginning, you can work in the console. So that's the thing you don't even learn, have to learn about files and, and things. So, so that makes the entry part, of course, easy. And then compared to the proper computer language with a compiler and, and where you have to declare all variables and things like that, it, that. So it was written to be, I mean, it was written to be fast and, and good at, and also good at prototyping, yes, and quickly get from, from data to a graphic without much coding, without, and that, and that was a geni genial thing to invent when they invented in the 1980s, I think, or even, even started in the end of 1970s, when the only other computer language basically was Fortran, and then after a while there came Sealong. Uh, and so that was that was really a gen genial genial idea is to say okay let's try something that is close to how we do formulas in math in some sense it works vectorized at that time no other vectorized well actually there was APL for those of you who may know it uh, that was my first computer language by the way APL when I was in gymnasium anyway no, I mean, the, the, that, that, that made that you can start using it. You get to a plot without having to learn about syntax, really. You can even just use visual pattern matching and you can get the plot uh, graphic. And that, that, that's very rewarding uh, to get people started, I think. And I'm, I'm really talking about non computer scientists here. And I think that strength is also its weakness. Um, yes, <laughs> I mean, we've probably all heard the quote, the advantage of R, it was developed by statisticians, the disadvantage of R, it was developed by statisticians. You can get really far with R without ever seeing a function and knowing and write or ever writing your own one or so on. So you don't, most other programming languages as you learn them and most of the things you described just Python has those as well. There's there's a command line. There's no compiler. It doesn't have typing. It's but that is a very well structured comp sci developed language. Peter von Rossum is a computer scientist who developed it. So when you learn Python, you very quickly learn about these paradigms of computer science. Um, but it's not quite as accessible as R is, and you can get very far with R just using it to get stuff done without having to learn these software development paradigms. And that's why the, the fork, there have been a few questions in the Q&A, okay, I'm an R user, how do I become an R developer? You might have gone quite far down that road and that jump is now big because you're suddenly missing a whole lot of stuff underneath which you never got taught, which you somehow need to backfill. Whereas other languages would never let you get that far without you having learned at least some of that along the way. I, I agree with what you say, Alexis, but the fact is that many people would stop using R if they had to learn all these concepts. <laughs> it's an awesome language for that very reason, sort of, and it is so fit for purpose uh, for just analyzing stuff. That's exactly the reason why, so within our organization, we have a lot of actuaries, people who know a lot of math, and we want to give them a tool to do more advanced analysis. Step away from Excel, please. R is obvious for that. It's so easy to get people going. 
Um, but when it comes to, okay, now one of these folks has written something which is really nice and you want to industrialize it, you want to productionize it, you want to deploy it, you often need to take 15 steps back and rebuild it from behind um, to get those engineering principles in place. And that's fine. It makes it perfectly appropriate. But it does mean and the same can happen to you in Python, no question. Uh, but it, it is one of the challenges when somebody goes, I'm an advanced R user, how do I become an R developer? There's a chasm. It's breachable. It's, if you're an advanced R user, you definitely are going to have the potential to become an R developer, but there's a whole bunch of stuff you need to learn to move across. Yeah. And Nick, well, what is for you the most important uh, uh, characteristics of R that makes it so approachable? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, I, I guess there's certain things like the R community. So it's, it's really easy to go out and get help on things. Like maybe, you know, in the past, I've tried to learn other languages. And, and uh, you know, years ago, I was a bit nervous about asking questions on Stack Overflow. It's a bit different now, but I'd be so hesitant about doing that. Whereas now I can go there, I can go to Twitter, and there's, there's so easily answers to my questions. And nobody laughs at my questions for being stupid, um, which I think really helps there. Thanks. And Rafael, do you think that maybe uh, Tidyverse would help uh, uh, making uh, R more approachable? Uh, in my experience, it has. Uh, it, I, I find it easier to teach using Tidyverse for the very simple things uh, and ggplot uh, also. Uh, so yeah, that, that I think has helped. But like I think this relates to what Alexis was saying that if you, at least in my lab, eventually you're going to have to do matrix multiplication uh, operations, and so it so you might get really far using tidyverse, and then at some point I'll say, oh, you can't use it anymore. You have to you have to now learn linear algebra and <laughs> and and do it this way. So yes, it does absolutely. Um, but I think the main the main reason why R is, is approachable is really the, what has been said by by Martin and Alexis that you can get to a plot really quick, and that, you know you can do that in different ways. I, tidyverse ggplot is perhaps the the one that's most intuitive to the general public, but even the R based way isn't that bad, or or you know whatever else people, but whatever else is out there, it's very quick. It's just like. That's that's why that's I think that's why statisticians in academia at least apply statisticians is the main reason they haven't they have kept using R even though you know Python might be a more better thought out language or whatever you want to call it it's because it, no nobody beats R if you what you want to do is explore data which is the most important part of my work is exploring data to to motivate statistical methodology to check statistical methodology and to test out if you know look for bugs the main way i look for bugs is by plotting stuff not by looking at the code and really i can't I, I mean i just i don't think there's a doubt that r is the best for that yeah i agree <laughs> um but on the other hand there's a Tediver seems to help uh, um for a new user to approach their language, but can it be uh, a problem for another user that wants to become an R developer, maybe due to uh, this non-standard evaluation? And I think, Martin, maybe you can comment on this? Yeah, I don't really know. Um, coming back to Alexis as well, uh, the, the chasm that he mentioned, I, I'm really trying, uh, as soon as I get away from just introductory or teaching, that, that tell my students, if you want to become a good data analyst even, you should write functions. You should get out of the habit of editing your R script. Like instead of writing a function, calling it three times, you, you they edit their scripts, right? And, and so it's not at all reproducible what they do because they change this line. And, and and so, so that I think that part of teaching can be done even to completely not computer science people, teaching them some discipline. I don't want to get uh, spaghetti code script from you. Um, that that helps, and that 
discipline is is more important than if you use the tidyverse or we are to be honest i teach them the indexing indexing like subsetting is very very powerful in r and has some in intricacies but but in some sense thinking of logical vectors to do indexing is much more useful in my my view than uh, than, than going with the tidyverse I think, I, very, very much. But I, I don't want to get into a fight there. But yeah. uh, it, it's also, it's my history. I've, I always found it quite intuitive. The, the indexing idea, the, the idea that indexing in R can help to double your data set, right? By just repeating the indexing. There are many, many things you can do once you understood this is much more than just extracting one element from a matrix. It, it's much, much more powerful. And, and it's just, it's all logical. Uh, but anyway, so people disagree or... or yeah, I don't, uh, I, I agree with you. I, I take, let's take an analogy for a kitchen. Sort of people want to cook food. Um, they can teach themselves. So you can figure out how to write our code. Maybe somebody helps you or you read the instruction manuals on how to use the machines which can cut your fingers off uh, because you can then make more advanced meals, but you then need to be careful. And I think what you're doing is that teaching and it's important, but then it comes, okay, you want to run a restaurant. You want to be the chef in a restaurant. It's not enough that you can cook good food. You also need to understand, okay, if you leave this standing for more than three hours, there's a risk of salmonella. You need to, there's a whole bunch of things which the cook in your home kitchen isn't even thinking about, which the restaurant chef is naturally doing because they have that additional training on top of it. And not everybody needs to be a restaurant chef, but if you want to be a chef in a restaurant, there are certain things you will want to be trained and have done and so on. And I'm absolutely saying that not everybody needs to be everywhere on the spectrum. You have people at home who cook amazing food and that's awesome. And these are the tools which allow them to do that. And that it's, a, and they, they are free and open source. And thank you to you and everybody else who has helped sort of produce that building. Um, and there is a certain group of people where we go, yeah, we want you to produce this industrially. Cool. Then you need to know certain industrial things. Awesome. And unfortunately, we don't have training courses for it for at the moment. We just find people who figure it out themselves and we try and help them get better at it. Great. I think this is a, a really nice analogy. Now, for uh, the sake of time, I would like to start looking at the questions in the Q&A. So I'm just going to start with uh, uh, the one that is on the top. I'm sorry, I didn't have the time to read them through before, so I'm going to read them about now. So uh, there's a question from Alexander uh, Courtois. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Anyhow, anyhow, the question is, as someone that started to learn computer science via R, I appreciate the narrow gap between the user and the developer. I started as a user, then started to code functions, then packages, and then adding C++. I do feel, however, that the recent uh, spread of packages built around non-standard evaluation, tidyverse, has widened this gap a lot. At the same time, it has generated many more users that may become developers. What is your view about such a gap between user and developers and, that the, and how to narrow it? So I guess this goes a little bit in the same direction of my question from before, but um, uh, yeah, we'd be very happy to hear some of your thoughts. Um, and you want to maybe Nika? You want to sure? Answer? Yeah. So yeah, no, that that's a really interesting question, and I, I also find it fascinating. Obviously, somebody talking about kind of getting C plus plus in there, and I'm I'm like that. That is definitely developer level, and um, I'm, I'm just starting that now. Um, I think the non-standard evaluation one is a really interesting kind of example to look at because I remember it was about 2018 early on when dplyr and kind of similar packages started using a lot of that stuff, and I really struggled with that at the start and, and could not wrap my head around it. And there's been so many resources that have come out since and um, breaking it down. There's now an R1 cheat sheet, which I've used a lot on recent work. Um, I can definitely see that perspective that it could widen the gap. But I think there was a really good talk a few years ago by Jenny Bryan at one of the R Studio conferences about basically there's loads of circumstances in which you might think you need tidy eval, but you don't actually need to use it. And it's more just thinking about how you achieve what you're trying to achieve. Um, so I think it can be challenging, it can be difficult in that gap, but I, I don't think that's necessarily a problem given the amount of power it can add to, to doing things. Yeah, 
then there's another question by some anonymous attendee who asks, um, accounting that uh, many R users are not from a software engineering background, what would be the path from an R user to an R developer? And where and how would one R user learn to be an R developer? And maybe Sandrine, you can uh, comment on this, uh, considering that we spoke about teaching uh, before. Sure. So, so I, I mean, I think there's multiple paths. That's a really good question where that transition occurs. Um, I think others have, have provided partial answers to this. So I think it's a combination of, um, you know, learning by doing, but also taking some workshops or courses, working with people that are more advanced than you are. I found that to me, that's been a really effective way of learning. Um, looking at packages that, that are good quality packages and learning by, by looking at the code for these packages and trying to implement some uh, of the techniques that are used in these packages. So um, it's really a range of paths to become a developer, I think. And you have to, you know, a lot of it goes back to experience. I think I, I you know, I really want to emphasize that. And Alex just mentioned it earlier. For, for software development as well as for applied statistics, a lot of it is an art. So you can learn some of it in a classroom or in a workshop, but then it's really doing it and experience and, and working with others as well. And I don't think there's a discrete point where you jump from being <laughs> a user to a developer. It's, it's, it's a progression and you'll become a more and more experienced at it. I and the community, really let me just go back again. The community, I think is a great way for that. The forums, the mailing lists, the documentation. I think that was a really great point that um, Sandrine meant about, uh, made about working with others, though, because one of the things that I found most useful for improving my R development skills is engaging in things like um, doing open source development and therefore having code reviews, um, engaging in pair programming. You know, there's so many courses out there, there's so many things you can read, but actually having that one on one kind of experience I found has accelerated my skills the most. I think also going back to what Sandrine said, uh, that it's a bit of a progression. There is a spectrum between the R user and the R developer. There is this other question about being, is it possible for a person to be both? And is it preferred? Considering that here in this panel, we always talk, talked about the two things as if they are distinguished. But is it even possible to be in certain projects an R user and in other projects an R developer? And uh, I don't know, maybe Rafa, that you can comment on this. I see you nodding. <laughs> Oh, I, I've definitely been both. I'm, I'm mo most of the time I'm, I'm an R user, but every once in a while I write a package more before than now. But then I become an R developer, I guess. Um, I'm not. I'm thinking about how to make the package efficient and and, use, and user friendly exclusively once I figured out what I want to do statistically. But to figure out what I want to do statistically, I did a lot of R using. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, I think in, in academia, especially, you're going to have a lot of people that do both. But as it has been mentioned throughout, it's the day has 24 hours, so it's going to be they, there are people that are very talented and they can be very, very good at both things. But in general, you know, the, the better you get at one, the, the less time you have for getting good at the other. And that's where I, I'm hoping that we could. There, there could be at least in academia, uh, but I think also in industry. I mean, the 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 cancer center I, I work at is more similar to industry sometimes than academia, uh, where where that will be also true. That we can have the, a division of labor that makes the whole operation more, more efficient, or you have in each task someone that's really really good at it, and and they're working in the same environment, so there's there's enough communication that it won't. That, it, that it, it won't suffer from the fact that it's two people uh, doing it together as opposed to, you know, just one person. I think it might be a bit of a tadpole question. When does the tadpole become the frog? And when does it stop being a tadpole? Uh, I've not yet found anybody who went and trained to become an R developer. Um, just like we've interviewed people for data engineering positions and there we look for R as well. They started using R to do the analysis. And over time, they found their own interests drove them to more. I'm really much more interested in building tools for other people than doing the actual analysis. So I will sharpen that skill set. And then one day they go, oh, here's an R developer role. I fit that perfectly. And it's not actually asking for PhD level data science. It's just asking that I can build stuff in R. I can do that. 
Um, so there is, I think you can be both, no question. Uh, I think a specialist is likely to be better than the average, uh, unless you find that unicorn uh, at the development, if they've focused some time on getting good at the development part. Thank you. I guess we can move on to the next question from Arnold Deckers, which is a, a bit of a different uh, point. So, um, he asks, uh, um, so in his experience, uh, a scientist needs to know well R, but as a, a statistician, it is very important to have good communication skills uh, to really discover what is the need by the scientists in the field. So, for example, environmental nutrition. Can you comment on this? Um, I don't know, maybe Alexis, you also mentioned this uh, um, emotional intelligence yeah. before. So that's, um, I used the word, word empathy earlier, and that's exactly what I mean. Um, again, it's a thing when you have a, the larger your team is, the more you are able to go, yeah, here's somebody with a very tight skill set and nobody talks to them um, because they're a bad communicator, but the team can absorb it given how we've spoken about how our developers are rare and they like to, you're likely to be only one in an organization you absolutely need to be good at especially the listening part of communication hearing what the other person wants then feeding back this is what actually can be done this is what we can commit to in the development feeding back and then ultimately delivering that is a communication skill So uh, for the sake of uh, having uh, communication uh, empathy here, maybe we should clarify something for Yadzana Adad, uh, who asks uh, what skills are required to jump from advanced uh, to developer, I guess, advanced user. And he mentions, I was thinking about our inferno, but that's just uh, internal. <laughs> Does deployment production mean knowing other languages? Or are you simply thinking, talking about the customer perspective? So maybe here we should clarify uh, the concept of production and um, maybe Nick, you can comment on this? Yeah, I, I, that's a quite a difficult one to pin down. So lots of different things talked about there. Um, you know, there were some ideas about, do you need to know other languages as well? Um, and I'd say not necessarily, although there are certain skills, like knowing a little bit of bash, a little bit of command line that can be useful. But then again, there's some fantastic packages now, like use this, which in combination with action, you can kind of automatically um, set up continuous integration for a package on GitHub straight from R. So whilst those other skills can be useful, I wouldn't say they're as necessary as they might have been a while ago. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten what the rest of the question was. <laughs> it was about, uh, um, say, um, do you need to know other languages uh, or it's just a customer perspective? Um, so, so I, I guess, was this the question that also talked about moving from an R user to an R developer as well? Yeah, I guess it's, uh, it was a bit of two questions in one. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think that the languages are necessary, but that's because I don't see that much distinction between an R user and an R developer, really. I, I just see it in terms of, you know, having a few of those software development skills at a minimum. Um, so that, that, that's kind of, yeah, hard to say with that one. Mm -hmm. Maybe because uh, look at the time, we just have uh, um, one more minute. So I would like to close with one uh, question that is about the future. So uh, are we expecting to have more support for our in production in future years? And maybe Martin, that you can uh, answer on this one. Uh, and you too, first. Questions about the future are always hard as we know as statisticians. Um, I, I'm not sure, as, as, some, as we mentioned implicitly, if it's needed at, at all, um, because Nick was making a point that uh, there is, uh, R can be used in many places in production and other places, maybe not. There, 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 yesterday I was at the use R talk where somebody presented Kafkaesque, which is a package to, to kind of interface to, to Kafka, which is kind of this high bandwidth uh, message passing. I don't, I didn't understand everything, but anyway, uh, I think that, I think R is also very much an interface between systems and, and can be used at that. But then 
if you have very high throughput uh, situations, I think that then the computer scientists need their very specialized uh, software tools. Uh, and, and R is not the, the good tool. Uh, the idea of S that John Chambers made that point also all the time, the idea is not that you do use this language for everything, use it for what it's really good and that's quite a lot. And then, and then you should also know its limit where you really want to go. Like if you, if you get satellite data, gigabytes per, per minute or, or even if it's just per half hour, maybe you shouldn't try to do the front to that system in R, but rather in, in the very dedicated system. So I think production always means several systems working together. In the end, in the end, it's the web browser that almost all users interface with uh, more and more, right? And production means you produce the contents of a web page. But that's not everything, right? In astronomy, you have to collect your data, or, or in particle sciences at CERN, also in Switzerland, as you know. I mean, they, they need different tools because they, they, they even process data when it's generated. They have to aggregate the data when it's generated from, from their particle physics. So they cannot, they, they need very, very special software for it, very, very, even very special hardware. So it's Production, as, as Alexis also said, the, the, the production can be very, very different things. Okay, so by looking at the, the clock, our time is unfortunately up. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank you all panelists for being here and uh, taking the time to discuss this topic with us. I see we have still many questions in uh, the Q&A and I would like to invite you all to um, join the Slack channel and continue the discussion there. Um, I will also uh, share the, the other results from our survey, which I didn't share live because the conversation was just so nice I didn't want to interrupt. Um, so uh, I guess uh, uh, this one is a wrap and uh, thank you all again and continue enjoying uh, USAR. I think the next one uh, uh, in the schedule is uh, a mix, no, is a, is a keynote or is it a mix uh, event? I'm not sure Do we have a slide with uh, what's coming up next. Otherwise I will quickly look it up. Okay, uh, so up next in the schedule today is the Mix R event. So yes, we have time to network and chat. So thank you once again, everyone. And um, hope to see you soon. Thanks. Bye everyone. Thanks. Bye. 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 Goodbye. <laughs>